Evolution in Action. <clears throat> a world-famous biologist brilliantly explores the future possibilities of man. Includes eight pages of illustrations. Julian Huxley. Contents. Preface. Chapter 1, The Process of Evolution. Chapter 2, How Natural Selection Works. Chapter 3, Biological Improvement. Chapter 4, The Development of Mental Activity. Chapter 5, The Path of Biological Processes. Chapter 6, The Human Phase. Preface. In all fields of inquiry, there is danger of not seeing the wood for the trees. Nowhere is the danger greater than in the field of evolution. My underlying thesis has been that there is a single evolutionary process to be studied and that the separate aspects of the problem only acquire full significance when considered in relation to the whole. This is particularly true of man and his history. It makes a great difference whether we think of the history of mankind as something wholly apart from the history of the rest of life or as a continuation of the general evolutionary process through with special characteristics of its own. In this little book, I have accordingly attempted to give a rapid survey of the evolutionary process as it looks today to a general biologist. In it, I've tried to stress on the one hand the unity of the process and on the other its special or unique features. There are mechanisms common to all life, such as the apparatus of heredity, the genetic outfit with its hundreds of genes, the occasional variations in the nature of genes due to mutation, the arrangements for distributing and combining gene variations provided by sexual recombination. There are common principles, such as the universal principle of natural selection, whereby favorable mutations gradually become incorporated as normal elements in the gene complex and the organism is adjusted to its environment. There are common trends such as adaptation, species formation, specialization of type over long periods of geological time, and deployment of groups to fill a greater range of places in the economy of nature. Superimposed on these, there is also the broad tendency towards advance in general efficiency of construction and working. And this involves the appearance of new capacities during the process. Striking examples of these are new ways of life such as flying and new sensory and mental or cerebral possibilities such as pattern vision and learning by experience. Here we pass from special to general. Among the special characteristics of the process, we have the emergence of mental capacities to the level where they may begin to affect the future course of events. Then there is the capacity for progress in the sense of advance which permits further advance instead of leading eventually into blind alleys of specialization. Progress in this case is unique since only one progressive line has continued into the present epoch the line leading to the man. This line is also unique in that it has enabled life to transcend itself by making possible a second mechanism for continuity and change. In addition to the genetic outfit and the chromosomes, this is man's method of utilizing cumulative experience, which gives him new powers of control over nature and new and more rapid methods of adjustment to changing in circumstances. To attempt this broad survey means drawing on very different branches of knowledge, from genetics and paleontology to animal behavior and human psychology, with an excursion into other subjects such as physiology and even history. It is obvious that no one man can hope to cover all of these subjects adequately. And I am sure that many of my statements will be necessarily imperfect expressions of current knowledge. I am also sure that many of them will turn out to be oversimplified. Nevertheless, simplification is sometimes desirable. In order to draw attention to general tendencies, otherwise the subject may become obscured in a mass of detail while unifying principles are lost to sight more apparently among contradictory particulars. Furthermore, I have attempted to present a point of view 
It is always based on facts, but is, in many respects, a particular and personal one. I hold strongly that without some knowledge of evolution, one cannot hope to arrive at a true picture of human destiny, or even to approach the problem correctly. It is possible that I may have an oversweeping in some of my conclusions, and I shall probably be attacked for going beyond the boundaries of science, but I am sure that I have been right in formulating general conclusions of this sort. Only one can hope to have them investigated, and general conclusions about man's origin and destiny are of importance, especially in an age of doubt and transition like the present. I owe a great deal to discussion with various biological colleagues. Among them, I would like to especially mention Professor H. J. Mueller, D. E. Ford, Dr., FRS, Professor Stanley Westall, FRS, and Dr. G. G. Simpson, but they are in no way committed to my particular views, for which I alone am responsible. The substance of this book was originally derived as a series of public lectures under the Pattern Foundation at Indiana University. I wish to take the opportunity of thanking the authorities there for all the help and encouragement they gave me. I later adapted my notes for a series of special talks for the BBC on the same subject. It is the text of these that serves as the primary basis for this book. J.H. London, May 1952